Wright was born in the Norfolk village of Erpingham in 1958, one of four children. He grew up in a military family, living on RAF bases around the world with his father, Conrad, a retired corporal. He's a normal child. I mean, no aggression. He's a typical boy, just wanting to play. But family life was far from happy, and Wright's mother left when he was just eight years old. Wright and his siblings stayed with their father, who went on to remarry. Whilst he was living with me, there was never a problem. Never, you know, never see one even. He was happy. He had, um, Little Barney's, I suppose, with uh, his stepmother at uh, times when he weren't uh, a bit mischievous, if you like. But it was nothing that you would sort of think about an hour later. Steve was not a particularly bright young man, but you know, cheery enough in his own way. Left school at 16 without any qualifications to speak of and got a job working as a chef on the ferries which sailed from Felixstowe to the continent. By the early 1980s, Wright had become a steward on the cruise ship, the QE2. And it was during this time he reportedly spent money on sex workers during trips to Thailand, which some experts believe may have altered his perception towards the opposite sex. I think he's got an expectation of women Women are there to perform a service for him, to, to play a particular role. They serve a function for him. And that's something that we continually see throughout the rest of his life. He would often return home from sea penniless. The world's media descended on Ipswich and the cameras were all pointed at the police. I think this case was one that attracted so much attention because it was unfolding in front of our eyes. This was the era of reality television when, when that started to become very popular. We were seeing it as it unfolded on 24-hour rolling news and you never knew what was going to happen from one day to the next. Detectives told prostitutes to stay off the streets, but their warnings were largely ignored. A local news crew interviewed one of the girls anonymously. Why, why well, have you decided to come out tonight? Because I need the money. I need the money, you know? Despite the dangers? Well, that has made me a bit wary about getting into cars, you know? But presumably you, you will do that tonight? Well, probably. The woman interviewed was Paula Clennell. Paula Clennell, she had children and um, she was always trying quite hard to change her life. You know, she was happy when saw her, you know, nice girl, but yeah, she, she tried quite hard, you know, to get out of it, you know, because it's a very hard thing to get out of the addiction if you still live generally in the same town. But yeah, she was trying, you know, to get away from it and change her life, bless her. Just six days after that news report aired, Paula Clennell was missing. In December 2006, the police in Ipswich were under mounting pressure to catch a prolific serial killer. The bodies of three dead prostitutes had been found in just 10 days. They had no clues or potential suspects, and the killing wasn't about to stop. Two more young women had gone missing. 24-year-old Paula Clennell, who'd been interviewed on the news just days before, and now police receive reports of a fifth missing woman, 29-year-old Annette Nichols, the best friend of fellow prostitute Jade Reynolds. Annette was a girl for me that oh, I was so humbled to know. You know, she always took time for me. She'd want to know if I was all right, if there's anything she could do. She'd do anything for anybody else. She was always well kept. She'd greet you with a smile and a happiness. You know, you felt all right when you was with Annette. I did. I could think, oh yeah, wicked. There she is, you know. I kind of, it was a relief because I know that I could talk to her. She'd understand my problems. So when she went missing, that's kind of like tearing out a piece of my heart. As the police searched for Paula and Annette, there was a macabre inevitability in the air amongst the mass of international journalists who'd gathered in Ipswich. There was almost certainly going to be another discovery. Where was it going to be? Who was it going to be? 
It was nail biting, and whilst it wasn't, it can't be described as fear. It was really palpable. You 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 sensed that from the people in the town. You sensed it from your colleagues, uh, but also from other colleagues from other media organisations and the police as well. On December the 12th, another body was found in Levington, just a mile away from Nacton, in the same woods where Annalee Alderton had been discovered days before. While somebody was out walking their dog, they stumbled upon the body of a fourth victim, just a few metres away from the main road in Levington. In the undergrowth, also this time not in water, again, the DNA was important in, you know, in this case. Um, but what seemed quite strange about this one is that it almost had an appearance of a rushed approach, that uh, this body was deposited by the side of the road. Albeit a few metres uh, off the main road, it, it had the appearance, or it seemed as if it was, had been done quickly. The police sent a helicopter up to survey the woodland for evidence. As it circled the area, they made a further gruesome discovery. Another body was lying in the woods only a hundred yards away. The naked bodies were those of the missing women, 24-year-old Paula Clonell and 29-year-old Annette Nichols. I don't think I'll ever get back what I had with Annette with another girl. You know, this is the most beautiful woman that I'd ever known that had become quite important to me that I could trust. You know, and now it's not there. I didn't go out after that. I was quite sensible, because, like, I couldn't, I emotionally couldn't go out and work on the streets after Annette was found. Five women had been murdered in Ipswich in just six weeks. The press had named the killer the Suffolk Strangler. Alderton and Clennell, they were both asphyxiated. That was the cause of their death in the other cases, the changes after death really prevented pathology giving a definitive answer, although I think it's reasonable to assume that someone who's killing five people in a short space of time probably used similar methods. Interestingly, none of the five victims showed any sign of sexual assault. So it isn't a rape murder. It's not, oh, I've satisfied myself, now I'm going to kill you, murder. It is a targeted murder without a sexual element. He is very much feeding off the media frenzy that, that's being created around his crimes. And he's increasingly feeling even more in control of, of what's going on. So he's changing the way that he's doing things and he's looking at the reaction from the media when he does that and he's absolutely loving it. He believes he's fulfilling something. Maybe he's convinced himself that He's clearing the world of prostitutes. They're all dumped very, really quite close to each other. Demonstrates that he thinks he's doing something in his own fantasy world that is cleansing the world of evil or cleansing the world of dirt or cleansing the world of inappropriate sexual appetite. We'll never know. I don't think Wright probably knows now. All I do know is that he had to be caught because he wouldn't stop until he was. On December the 15th, Tanya Nichols' dad, Jim Jewell, made an emotional plea for the killer to turn himself in. Tanya has been taken by someone who needs to be found. We ask for anyone who knows this person or persons to come forward and contact the police. With increasing pressure to make an arrest, police decided to question a local 37-year-old man. He was identified because he had spent considerable time in a radio car talking to a radio journalist and uh, other um, TV journalists. I spent a bit of time with him uh, to try and get to know his relationship with the girls. There was uh, a kind of a, an, an understanding be between them that you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. He was uh, loosely associated as a friend of one or more of the girls who were murdered. And at that stage, he became of significant interest to the inquiry. There was a very strong feeling from some of the media people present that this man was the right man and should be looked at more seriously. 
With a suspect in custody, detectives received a lead from the forensics lab. The three bodies that were found on dry land did have DNA evidence on them. In a one in a billion chance, the DNA found on all three women was the same. But whose was it? The DNA was run through the national database and police got a match. But to their surprise, it wasn't the man they had in custody. At that time, and as it still stands today, if a person is arrested or convicted of an indictable offence or serious offence, uh, they can have their DNA taken and held on the database. The DNA matched that of a local man who'd been convicted of stealing £80 from a pub till in 2002. 48-year-old Steve Wright. And it was that match which led to significant additional work including then the CCTV evidence, which showed a vehicle being used by Wright moving between some of the locations around the relevant times. So he became a major suspect in the inquiry. Over just six weeks, five prostitutes had been murdered in Ipswich. The police finally believed they'd found the killer, 48-year-old Steve Wright, whose DNA had been found on three of the bodies. Wright had not been a suspect at any point during the police investigation, even though he had been stopped during routine checks of the red light district. Whilst the world's media was focusing on a local man who police currently had in custody, Wright was put under surveillance. <laughs>